So this morning we're going to get into uh, the continuation of the study of the book of Daniel. We're in chapter 9. And chapter 9 is a very, is probably the most, if, if not the most, one of the most significant prophecies in all of the Old Testament. We've already studied through the book of uh, Daniel up through chapter 8. We're moving into chapter 9. And as we said one uh, week, a couple weeks ago, the book of Daniel is really divided up into a couple of different chapters uh, or sections. The first uh, six chapters are really stories about Daniel and his uh, companions. Then you move into a, some specific uh, instances with the visions of Belshazzar and instance with him. And now we've moved into the what's called a, a apocalyptic uh, prophecies that Daniel received. And, as we look at, as we start going through here, there's this period in this chapter, you're looking at two different elements. In fact, this lesson should be divided into two parts and expounded upon in, in great detail, but we just don't have that luxury. Uh, the way our Sunday school lessons uh, have been given to us, this is really combined and we're going to have to condense it all into one lesson. But it's really divided into two parts. When you look at uh, what's happening here, what's, what's taking place is really taking place during the time period in, uh, around the sixth chapter of Daniel, when Darius is king of, um, of Babylon at this particular time. He's made king of the, of the realm of the Chaldeans at this particular time. And, uh, the first several verses, 1 through 19 actually, involves Daniel's prayer. And we're going to get into that in, in just a minute, but if you remember back into to Daniel chapter 6, uh, Daniel was found to be in prayer in violation of the order that the Chaldeans had set up really to entrap Daniel, and he was thrown into the lion's den. Daniel was a man of prayer. He always had been a man of prayer. He was going to maintain that. It was his practice. It's what he did. And that would forever change not only Daniel, but everybody around him. Everybody who perceived what Daniel was about, who he was, how he believed, the knowing him to be a man of prayer. So let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, in the lineage of the Medes, who was made king of the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the book's the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now Darius is somebody we really don't know a whole lot about. He's mentioned a couple times in scripture. He's mentioned here. He's mentioned in Ezra. Uh, we really don't know a whole lot about him. We don't know if he was related to Cyrus. We don't know if he was one of Cyrus's generals. We know Cyrus was the king of Persia. He ruled over this particular area during this time, but we really don't know a whole lot about him, who exactly he was. But here's what we know. He was made king. He was not of a king, uh, kingly heritage. He was made king. He was made ruler over this particular realm. And it was in his first year, which was somewhere where around 538 B.C., that this all began to happen. Now, this, uh, this setting of the stage, Daniel's laying out the time period that this happened. And what Daniel was doing is he was reading the word of God. He was in the readings of Jeremiah. And he was um, in chapters 25, what we would call chapters 25 and 29. And the reason we know that is because in those particular uh, chapters of Jeremiah, if you'll flip over there with me to Jeremiah chapter 25, uh, we'll see exactly what uh, Daniel was reading. But before we get into too much of that, uh, Daniel had been taken captive in 605 B.C. He was 67 years a captive. And he was taken captive when he was in his mid to late teens. Uh, so during this particular time, Daniel was an old man. I mean, he was at least 70 years old himself. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 80, close to 80 years old himself. He was an old man. So uh, he's studying the books. He's studying the prophecies. And what we see here in Jeremiah chapter 25, if you go over there with me to verse 10, it says, Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, uh, 
the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, and the sound of the millstones, and the light of the lamp. What God is saying to, to Jeremiah in this prophecy is he's going to take these things away from the people. Why is he taking them away from the people is really the question. Well, what you notice here is the voice of mirth. He's taking away laughter. He's taking away the voice of gladness. He's taking away the joy of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The sound of the millstone. He's taking away daily activities. He's taking away those things that people did every day. But notice in the scripture, these people were not taking every day a voice of prayer. There was no voice of praises to God. They had forgotten God. They turned their back on God. And because of that, God was bringing judgment on them. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So at this point, Daniel is reading these scriptures in, in what we call chapter 25, and also over in, in chapter 29, where these, this prophecy is laid out. And Daniel starts figuring up, okay, I have been a captive here in this land for 67 years. I know there's only three years left. In, these particular, uh, in this particular time, though, we need to remember there were three invasions, uh, three points of captivity that took place in this judgment of Israel. The first one occurred in 605 B.C. when Daniel was one of the captives along with his other uh, companions and taken off to Babylon. The second one occurred in 597 B.C. when Jerusalem was attacked and all the treasure from the, the uh, temple was taken. And then in 587, the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem occurred, and the nation falls entirely and is completely exiled from the area. So when Daniel's reading this, there's three possibilities for that 70 years. When he was taken captive, when the temple was uh, overran and all the, the articles taken out of the temple, or when the nation finally fell completely. And so Daniel's praying here. He's praying with earnest. Uh, when he gets started because he understands that if God takes the earliest time period, there's only three years of captivity left. So I want you to look real quick at how Daniel approaches this understanding of the scripture. Now, another thing for us to remember is Daniel was not of a priestly lineage. He, uh, he wasn't qualified specifically for any special ministry. He wasn't a prophet like Isaiah or, um, or Jeremiah. But what Daniel was, was a lover of God. He understood from the scripture what God said he was going to do. And he also knew that if he petitioned God, if he asked him, that God would respond. The reason he know, has known this so specifically is because he's done it before. If you remember back in the very first chapter, when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream that he couldn't recall, and, and all the, the Chaldeans and the astrologers and all the wise men came together. They couldn't tell him what his dream was. And Daniel comes in when the king said, hey, we're going to kill them all. And Daniel was included among the wise men, but he came in and he said, just wait. Let me go to my God. And he gets his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they come in and they pray. And they pray for God to reveal not just the dream, but also the interpretation. And God answers and shows him exactly uh, what the king had dreamed and what it means. So Daniel has been through this before and throughout the, the chapters preceding this, God has repeatedly answered over and over and over again and taught him those deep mysteries. And at times when Daniel didn't understand, just like we looked at last week, when Daniel didn't understand, Gabriel comes to him and explains it to him. God gave the interpretation, gives the explanation and it enlightens him. So let's look at what Daniel does next. In verse 3, he says, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, 
We have sinned and committed iniquity, and we've done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face. As it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. So Daniel begins to pray. Now I want you to understand very quickly, he is in preparation first for prayer. And that's such an important lesson that we all have to learn. You just, you have to get in the right mindset of prayer because sometimes people pray mindlessly. One of the most devastating things the devil has ever done to the church has told us that we can just pray mindlessly. Uh, some religions, we know Catholicism being one of them, have repetition prayers that you go through. You're not even thinking about why you're praying and to whom you're praying, but you're repeating words because those seem like the things you need to do and the things you need to say. That's not how we are supposed to pray. First of all, we have to understand what we're praying about, and we have to pray with passion, and we have to be earnest in prayer. Here, Daniel knew exactly what he wanted. He knew exactly what he wanted to ask God for. He came to God, and he said, you've established already, God, this time. He has the understanding this time of 70 years has already been established. And he comes to him, and he says, first of all, I set my face, which means I have determined, I have a purpose. I have an objective here. You know, when we think about uh, turning our face to God, that gives an implication that at some point our face has been turned away from God. We've been distracted. We've been looking at other places and looking in other directions. But here Daniel's saying, I turn my face toward God. I'm wanting to look at him and give my petition because I know he'll hear me. I know this God that has answered me over and over and over before is going to hear me when I cry out to him. And he set his face to him, and then he shows here that he did this with the right attitude. He came to God, it says, to seek by prayer and supplication with fastings, with sackcloth, and with ashes. So he fasted. He said, nothing else matters. Nothing else. Food doesn't matter to me. I'm going to come to you, God. I'm going to fast. I'm going to get my mind right. I'm going to get my attitude right. I'm going to get set in the, uh, get my mind set on coming to you, the Holy Father, the, the ruler of all things, to ask you for something in particular. And he come with sackcloth. Now, most people don't know what sackcloth is. Most of us that have been raised in the country, we know that the old the old dresses back in the hills years ago, uh, for the younger people that might have seen the Beverly Hillbillies, when their granny made, made uh, uh, clothes out of uh, flour sacks. But back in the hills, they used to do that. They'd take the old flour sacks, and during the wartime, they actually took those potato sacks and made them in a flowery print so see, people could reuse those to make clothes out of. But this sackcloth was made, up, made out of goat's hair. And that goat's hair was an irritant. You just couldn't wear it. It's like wearing wool next to the skin. It was itchy. It was uncomfortable. And when they put that on, it reminded them of their iniquity, of their sin, of their inadequacy. And so he put that on because when he come to God, he didn't want to be comfortable. He didn't want to be uh, at ease. He wanted to be reminded of why he's coming in prayer. So he puts a sackcloth on it and this irritant that he's wearing. And then he put ashes on, straight out of the fire. Now, you know, that is a stinking smell when you take those old ashes. They just smell. But they're also dirty. They're, they're greedy. Uh, but he put those ashes on, and the ashes reminded him that he's unclean. Now, set your, set your mind to thinking about exactly what he's doing. He said, I've turned my face toward this holy God. And I fasted. I've gotten ready for this audience with the king of all creation. And I put on the sackcloth to remind me of my sin and these ashes to remind me that I'm unclean. And I'm coming to this holy, pure, uh, all-powerful God with a petition. And he cries out to him. He says, great and awesome God. Uh, and the King James, is, is, he he. Words are a little different, um, but it, it's, it's an 
a description of understanding who you're talking to. He's not just, you know, a lot of people go very casually to the throne of God. But we're talking about the creator of all things. The one who comes out and speaks his word and all things come into being. And he understood who he come to talk to. He was convinced because of his prior experience that he knew God was going to hear him. But he also knew who he was approaching. And he's asking God to perform something that God already said he was going to do. And that's the next key to prayer. See, God had already told Jeremiah the length of time. He'd already told him that he was going to recover his people. He was going to restore them at this time period. And Daniel comes to God and says, God, you've already said what you're going to do. So I'm coming to you and petitioning you to do what you've already said you were going to do. Here's the other example to us for how our prayer should be. First of all, we have to have our mind right. We have to understand who we're talking to. But the next most important thing is to follow the same example, and that is invoke the promises of God. When you start coming in and saying, hey, God, I've read in your word what you've promised this or you've promised that, you're invoking his own will. When we come to God in his will and we ask his will be done, then we know he's going to hear us. Then we know he's going to answer because we're told that sometimes we don't know how to pray. We pray in error. But when we pray his promises, we can never err because his word is infallible. It shows us, excuse me, it shows him when we pray his will, when we pray his promises, that we believe him. Why would you come to God and pray at a time and in a way that you didn't believe? Spurgeon once said, sometimes we ask little and God gives it. In other words, we come to God with our prayer not asking nearly as much as he's willing to give. And when you come and ask God's promises, he's going to honor his promises. So and then he goes on and begins in, in verse um, as we've already read here, he goes down and he talks about how they have sinned. Now, Daniel, if you start looking at how his, his language here, let's look back again. He says, um, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. Neither have we heeded your servants. And over and over, he says, we and our. Now, this prayer lasts to the 19th verse. So for 16 verses here, the first three verses we can't count, but the first 16 verses in his prayer, Daniel over and over it says, we and our. He's praying this prayer of unity. He's including himself. Now if you look back through all of our recorded uh, lesson here, nobody can argue that Daniel wasn't a devout worshiper of Jehovah God. Everybody can see that. He had absolute confidence in God, absolute faith. He glorifies God in every way possible. Every time he, you turn around, even in the very first chapter, when he tells Nebuchadnezzar, I don't possess any special skill. This is all God. He's, he's glorifying God and witnessing about God's power in the very first chapter of this book. And throughout, he's constantly recognizing God as being the source of everything. So nobody can say that he's not a committed worshiper of God, but he understands that when you look at a holy God, even the very best of us are wretched. Even the very best of us are horrible sinners. And he understands that and he includes himself here. He understands that when he approaches a holy God, that he is one of the ones who was taken into captivity because of the sin of the nation. And so he includes himself in this great... Uh, prayer of unity, understanding, or unity and confession. Interesting thing of when he starts confessing these sins of the people, and he includes himself, again, 18 times he says we, 12 times, he, 22 times he says our. He makes sure he prays this prayer of unity and not saying, well, they've done this and these other people have done that. He understands that the whole people, all of us, all of mankind, have fallen short. Kind of brings back to remembrance of another prayer that was given or described to us by Jesus. I remember when Jesus taught in the parable about the Pharisee and the publican, and they're in the in there, and you hear the Pharisees say, "God, I thank thee that I'm not like these other men." 
That was a self-righteous, self-serving prayer. But the other one hits his chest and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. He, he knew that he needed God. That he was not above uh, needing mercy. Just have mercy on me. And that's what Daniel's doing. He's praying for mercy. His confession of sin could seem like it wasn't genuine until you see his passion. He's absolutely passionate. He understands that I've got to have this God to restore all of us, and I'm one of us. Remember David's prayer after his sin with Bathsheba? When he writes, he says, God, I've sinned against you and you alone. You're the only one I can sin against. I might have wronged others, but I can't sin against them, but I can sin against you. And David understands that it's God that we offend. Sometimes we forget who it is we're sinning against. We have to remember that, yeah, we can do wrong to other people. But God's the one that sets the moral code. and He's the one that we actually sin against. David didn't come, excuse me, Daniel didn't come to complain, but he come to confess. And a lot of people have the wrong idea about what confession's about. A lot of times people just come in and say, you know, I, I've made a mistake. Uh, I was wrong and uh, I've fallen. No, we sinned. The majority of the time it's a willful, knowing rebellion that we choose to make those, those mis mistakes. And when we come and confess, we have to come and say, God, I've sinned against you. I've wronged you. And I have to make this right. God wants us to verbalize it. He already knows what we've done. But he wants you to say it out loud that you understand what your sin is. And that you understand that you need to be forgiven by a holy God. So Daniel's exhibiting humility in prayer. Now, sometimes we think about this, this lowering of ourselves in humility as being uh, something that's beneath us. But when you come to a holy God, you're already as low. You, you can't go any lower than being a, the dust of the earth. We have to consider ourselves to be, when we approach a holy God, we have to have that humility. Now, back years ago when I was playing football, I never forget, yeah, I was playing offensive line. And, of course, I played defensive line, too. I, I went both ways uh, when I was in high school. And, and But we always were taught when we played an offensive line that we wanted to be able to hit that defensive lineman low and get the leverage and push him up because that's the only way we could push back. And when we're playing defensive line, that's the thing they taught us. Don't let them get underneath you. Don't let them get low and get leverage. But when we come to God lowly and with the right attitude like Daniel did, we gain leverage in that God sees that we're sincere. He hears us because he resists the proud. When you humble yourself and get low, God hears. Daniel cries out and he says, uh, I, I'm no, not making any excuse for us, God. We deserve this. We absolutely deserve judgment. All this disaster that's come upon us, we deserve it. He confesses the sin of all of us. And then he goes on in verse 16, excuse, uh, yeah, in verse 13. He talks about this. He says, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Here's the other thing Daniel understood. And this thing that's written in the law of Moses was talking about being outcast, being put out of the land of promise. And that's what's happened to them. Because of their rebellion, because of their willful sin, against God. They've been outcast. They have been exiled from the land for a period of judgment. And he understands that. But here's the thing he's saying is we understand we've not prayed prayers of forgiveness. We have not gotten ourselves right in our right attitude of forgiveness. And he's coming confessing on behalf of the people. What's another time that you can remember when one person came and confessed for the entire nation the sins of the people. Well, let's flip over to Nehemiah. And if you look back over to, in Nehemiah, in verse, five, <clears throat> in verse 5 of chapter 1, it says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. It sounds familiar. That it sounds like what Daniel said. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who you love, you, uh, you and observe your commandments, 
Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Here, Nehemiah is doing the exact same thing that Daniel is doing. He's confessing the sins not only of himself, but the entire nation. How often have you prayed on behalf of your brothers and sisters within the, your local body? But of your community, your state, your country, and the world, understanding that we have fallen short. We are not recognizing God the way we should. That's what Nehemiah did. That's what Daniel is doing here. He's asking God to hear. He's praying and pleading with God. He's saying later on in, in verse uh, 17, I believe it is, to, for God to incline his ear, to lean down and listen at this cries of for mercy and for, for God to hear this prayer. Daniel prayed as a patriot, but not as a patriot of Israel. He prayed as a patriot for the kingdom of God because he knew that the people of God needed to be restored. He needed them to get their hearts right, their minds right, their attitudes right. Daniel asked this, because he, and he goes on to say, that you would receive glory, not for our sakes, because we don't have any righteousness, but that you would receive glory and honor. And that's what Daniel is asking about. We should always pray, every prayer, that God receive glory. We don't deserve any glory. We're undeserving of anything. But we should always pray that God would be lifted up and that he would be glorified. That's our attitude. There's nothing wrong with praying for our own needs. Jesus even told us in his example prayer to ask God for our daily bread. There's nothing wrong with that. But the biggest thing we should ask in prayer is that God be glorified, always. Going back to that, how did Jesus teach the disciples to pray? He started off by saying, hallowed be thy name. In other words, holy is your name. So we lift up God and he's glorified first in our prayer. So this purity of motive in Daniel's prayer is evident. He's not great because he prayed. He's great because he exercised uh, uh, the understanding of glorifying God in the prayer. That's what makes the prayer, prayer so powerful. And then it happens. Then ha happens the most important thing, the last eight verses of this chapter which is hotly debated uh, people for centuries have debated exactly what this meaning uh, of this interpretation is but here's what we know the very first thing that happens is we find out Daniel's prayer is heard he says why he's still speaking praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. In other words, the holy mountain being Jerusalem. While I was still speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Now there's so much in this. There's so much that we can learn here. But we remember Gabriel came to him and he knew that he was a messenger of God and he he passed out. We, we talked about that last week. He went down. He was unconscious. He was asleep on his face. And Gabriel touched him and rose him up and gave him the understanding of what the vision was. So he understood and knew who Gabriel was. He saw him again, so he wasn't quite as uh, startled by this man of God as he was the first time. But Gabriel comes to him while he's confessing. You see, when we confess to our sins to God... God immediately is invoked into action. When his people confess their sin, he immediately responds. And Gabriel's seen, this is one of the few times in Scripture we see where angels are flying. He flies in. He, he may, is made to fly swiftly to him. And he comes to him about the time of the evening offering. Now, we know that the offerings in the temple could not be offered because the temple's been destroyed. But Daniel continues to pray at a time when the evening sacrifices would have been made as an honor to God, as a, as a ritualistic uh, remembrance of when those offerings would have been made. That's the special time when Moses offered the Passover lamb. It's the time when, the, uh, when Jesus was crucified and, and, and died and the actual uh, 
penalty for all of us was paid. So, so Gabriel comes and he says exactly, he does exactly what all of us want. Every time we pray is we want an answer. And God gives it to him right here. Immediately, Daniel gets an answer. Wouldn't it be great that every time we step, sit down in prayer, that we would get an immediate answer? That God doesn't always work that way, but he did here. So he immediately comes to him, and look what he says here. Uh, in, when, when Gabriel comes to him and he says, um, and he informed me. He informed him. In, in other words, he began to enlighten me. He began to tell me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I've come forth to give you skill and under, to understand. In other words, the ability to understand these things. At the beginning of your supplications, from the time you started to pray, and I think even from the time he began to fast and getting ready for the prayer, at the very beginning, God made preparation for this answer to prayer to Daniel. And he says, at the very beginning of your supplications, the command went out. God gave the order. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. God stops right here at the very, very beginning of this response. And he says, first of all, Daniel, I love you. I love you. All of us, when we pray, we should have that feeling to know that God hears us because he loves us. That would have been enough. If Daniel hadn't gotten anything else from Gabriel to hear the response from God and said, Daniel, you're greatly loved. That would have been enough. That would have been enough to, to make Daniel rejoice after all he's been through when these visions have made him physically and emotionally and spiritually sick where he was in the bed for days to hear God dispatch his angel to tell you you're greatly loved by this holy God that you're worshiping. Man, what a... What an amazing, amazing thing to have happen. But he comes to here, comes to Daniel here, and he said, you're greatly loved. Now, often we sing the song here, uh, Chris Tomlin's song, Jesus loves me. He loves me. He's for me. What does Scripture tell us about his love for us? If he be for us, who can be against us? Daniel's faced adversity through his entire time being held captive. Even though he's been raised to a position of governmental authority, he's still been a captive. He has even been cast into a lion's den. He's been criticized. He's been mocked. He's been rebuked. But God loves him, and that's all that really matters. So then Gabriel says, here's what you have to understand about these things, Daniel. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. In verse 24, we have outlined the entire purpose of what the 70 weeks is set out to accomplish. To finish the end of transgression. Transgression means the rebellion against God. To take this very literally, literally means that a whole new order in the world is going to have to be established because man's sin has to be taken out. In fact, it goes on here to make an end of sin, which means not just taking away your guilt of your sin, but to take away sin completely. To seal it up, to restrain it, means to make an entire new world. It goes on to make a, to make a reconciliation for iniquity. Iniquity must be reconciled because God is holy. He cannot coexist with iniquity. That was done at the cross. Jesus made that entirely possible through his sacrifice at the cross. To bring in everlasting righteousness, that was through the Messiah. To anoint the most holy, and that really should be understood as the most holy place, that being the temple, that being the place that will be anointed and blessed. Now, taken as a whole, Gabriel makes this announcement to Daniel that's beyond anything that he could have ever expected. He tells him all of these things would happen within a period of 70 weeks. And we have to remember what Daniel was doing when, at the very beginning of this chapter. He'd been reading about the 70 years of captivity. He had lived through 67 of those years of captivity himself. So he's still thinking of literal chronological years, time periods. 
But what Gabriel's getting ready to tell him about is there's specific things that are going to take place through the 70 weeks. Now, therefore, know, uh, therefore, and understand that from going forth of the command to restore and build the, uh, Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall and even, troublesome, uh, even in troublesome times. So what is that a reference to? All right, we have to go back and do some more history lesson like we did last week. We understand that during Artaxerxes, a decree that during his time of rule, he gives Nehemiah a direction, permission. Going back to Nehemiah chapter 2 again. Remember, Nehemiah has, has prayed to God and confessed because he's gotten this news about how the, the, the land has been basically destroyed, the walls have been torn down, and the gates burned with fire. And he comes into the king and he looks sad in front of the king, and he's never done that before. And the king asked him, asked him what's wrong, and he became afraid because it was under penalty of death to be sad in the king's presence and, and to even speak out of turn to the king. But remember, he's the king's cupbearer. He has a close relationship with him. And the king asked him, he said, this is nothing but sorrowfulness of heart. What's, what's going on? And he said, I became dreadfully afraid, and I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city and place of my fathers and tombs and lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire, and the king said to me, what do you request? The king is asking him what he wanted. And then he does this. He prays the God of heaven. He said, I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servants found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And then he goes on to ask for letters to go with him and for equipment and, and supplies to be provided. Artaxerxes makes it happen for Nehemiah. Not only does the, the city begin to be rebuilt, but he pays for it. This is an answer to prayer. And from that time to the time of the Messiah was 483 years. If you do the math on that, that's 69 units of seven. 69 units of seven will pass between that command for Nehemiah to go and restore the city to the appearance of the Messiah. In fact, if you look in uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, it was in the month of Nisan, which would be our uh, March-April time period in that month that kind of overlapped our months. And if you look at that, it's in the month of Nisan, that March-April time period, where he goes back. Now, Artaxerxes came to power sometime around the year 465 B.C., but his first full year of reign was not counted into 464 B.C. When Nehemiah chapter 2 occurs, it's in his 20th year, so sometime around March of 44 B.C., according to the Gregorian calendar. Now, here comes the math. Sir Robert Anderson understood that the Hebrew calendar operated on 360-day year. But the Gregorian calendar operated on a 365-day year. Understanding the differences between the two, Sir Robert Anderson came up with calculations that determined this 483-year year period was to the day in fulfillment of this prophecy to the time the Messiah came in. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. When did the Messiah came, come on scene? He came on scene on Palm Sunday. Sunday. He came in for the first time, for the first time in, uh, in Luke chapter 19, we see Jesus riding into the city on the back of a colt. And for the first time, he publicly accepted the worship and praises of the people. He, for the first time, he acknowledged publicly and openly to, to the public at large who he was. And he accepted that in fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy that had been recorded in the Old Testament. So Jesus deliberately arranged this event to show himself as the Messiah. So now we see this 483 year period being fulfilled. And then he goes on, Gabriel does, and he, he gives the explanation here. He said that going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, uh, until the, Messiah the Prince... There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. 
The street shall be built again, the wall, and even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And, for, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the, uh, until a, the end of the war desolations are determined. And we'll stop right here real quick and look and see what happens. So at the end of the 69th week, the Messiah shows up and then he's cut off. This cutting off, if you look out throughout scripture, the cutting off refers to execution. He's cut off, but not of himself. Look what it says here. It says, he shall be cut off, but not for himself. That reference means it's not because of anything he has done that he's executed. And that's the direct description of what the Messiah was to do, to come and to die for your sins and for my sins. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And that, that, that 69th week was accomplished at the time of the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've got another week to go before Easter Sunday, so this is very appropriate to look at this particular prophecy. But then I want you to look in detail because we've already talked about uh, in earlier lessons some of the things that could have fulfilled uh, part of this prophecy, but this prophecy was not fully fulfilled uh, according to the way some historians like to believe. This particular prophecy, if you start looking at it, uh, when he goes on, he says, this prince that is to come is a reference to the prince, what we would call the Antichrist. Those, that one that is, that is totally opposite, the anti, the, uh, the foil of Christ, the one who is going to be absolutely opposite of what Jesus is going to be or has been. Has been. And it says here that he's going to come in and he'll confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now this one week throughout here, the first 69 weeks were 69 sevens, seven year periods. 69 seven year periods for 483 years. This last one week period is going to be seven days. Excuse me, seven years, not seven days. So the seven-year period, this last week, the 70th week, is yet to come. Now, some people thought that Antichus Epiphanes was the fulfillment. He did a lot of the things that the Antichrist is yet to do, but he didn't fulfill this prophecy completely. He did not make a covenant with the Jews. He came in and actually made the Jews set up an altar in their temple to worship Zeus, he wound up calling for them to worship him like the Antichrist will do, but he died at the hand of disease. Uh, he did not fulfill everything in this prophecy. So what we want to look here is, is who is this prince that's going to be that's going to make this covenant? For three and a half years, or three and a half days, look here, it says, it be in the middle of the week. So if you start looking at, at that seven-day period that's a week, the middle of the week will be three and a half years. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Sacrifices have not been able to be made because the temple didn't exist. So the temple has to exist for there to be sacrifice and offering. The temple today does not yet exist. How and when is it going to be rebuilt? We don't know. We don't know if the Antichrist is even going to build it for the Jews. But here's what we do know. There are some things that have set place even in the last couple years to make this all come to pass. That's why I think this is the most exciting time that we, that we could have ever lived in. The thing you have to, have to look at and remember about this is, is we, for the first time since the nation of Israel has existed in modern times, the first time now Jerusalem is recognized as the capital of the country. That's happened because of the order of our president other countries have resisted that. But now it's recognized as being the capital of the country. Everything is set in place now to begin the rebuilding and the reestablishment of the temple so that sacrifices could be made and this covenant, this agreement could be made between the Antichrist and the, and the Jews. There's another description in Scripture of this period. Uh, if you flip over to, to Revelation chapter 13, and it, this is a description of the same beast, the same uh, Antichrist. And in chapter 13, verse 5, it says, And when he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, he was given authority to continue for 42 months. 
Then he opened his mouth and blasphemed me against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. Now, 42 months is three and a half years. John the Revelator understood this period of time. He understood the prophecy that was given to Daniel of this period of time in that seventh week. And in, in Daniel, we go back here, it says, And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation which is determined is poured, poured out on the desolate. This is a fulfillment of the scripture. Even um, Jesus had referenced this abomination that takes place. It refers to an absolute horrific idolatry that takes place in the temple. And that idolatry is when one calls himself God and takes God's glory away. And we started out this lesson talking about the need to get our minds right and our attitudes right and everything before we ever enter into prayer. To give God glory, to let him have his will in everything that's done and make sure that everything that's done gives him honor and gives him will, uh, give him glory in everything that's done. When this Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to try to rob God. He's going to try to take God's glory and to set up for himself set up himself to be God. We know what's going to happen. We know that times are set right. And I believe right now we're setting at the, the dawn of the seventh week. At any moment we could find ourselves at that beginning. At any moment, that seventh week, that seven years will count down. What we should be excited about is because of we're at the dawn of that seventh week, we're at the dawn of the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Where are we today? Are we praying God that his will be done? Because his will is to take his bride home. His will is to make us his bride in his presence. Are we praying for it? Do we have our minds right? Have we fasted? Have we prayed? Are we coming to him lowly? And praying that his will be done? Or are we so caught up in the things around us, in the world, in the circumstances, and we're looking at things happening, unfolding in our world with pestilence and difficulty and financial problems and uncertainty and fear? Are we consumed with that? Or are we consumed with, God, your will be done? Even so, Lord, come on down. Maranatha, come on down. I ask you today to evaluate. Where are you? Are you looking forward to that last week? Or are you fearful of it? Because if you're fearful of the last week, I ask that this morning you find your place somewhere, get on your knees, and pray for forgiveness. You should be excited. You should be looking forward to that return of the Lord and Savior, the one who says to you, you're greatly loved. Thank you for being in Bible study hour. We look forward to seeing you again on Easter Sunday.